Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I'm happy to go over some of the details of the events themselves, but what I wanted to do is provide a little bit of context and highlight uh, uh, some of the main areas where the leaders showed some uh, showed movement and were able to advance the uh, trilateral agenda that we've been working very actively since the last North American Leader Summit. So on Wednesday, the United States, Canada, and Mexico uh, shared their hope and vision for a prosperous and secure future for our citizens. That was reflected in the leader's statement. This is more than about uh, the size of our economic relationships, although they are vast and we are each other's largest uh, export destinations and among our largest trading partners. So it is, this is, North America is where all three of us really uh, found our prosperity and our, our prosperity is based on these relationships, but it is more than that. This is a, a region that's increasingly interconnected uh, and that affects every aspect of the citizens' uh, lives in all three countries. And, and so the presidents uh, wanted to uh, have an opportunity to highlight what matters uh, most in the relationship and what is most visible, but also some of what uh, is helping build those, those increasingly integrated structures. So our, our economies are deeply integrated. U.S. trade with goods in goods uh, with Canada and Mexico has more than tripled over the last 20 years. Uh, and today it's more than $1 trillion annually, over $3 billion a day, something that all three leaders uh, highlighted in their uh, public uh, remarks as well as in their meeting. Uh, just by way of example, Canada and Mexico, as our biggest export markets, uh, are the destination for more goods individually than we sell to Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa combined. So it gives you a sense of scale of where these relationships are. Uh, and as the president highlighted in his remarks, mm -hmm. it's more than about selling things to each other, it's about building things together. And a lot of the attention, much of the focus of the, uh, of the uh, decisions that were undertaken by the leaders were focused on ways that we can increase our competitiveness in the world by making it easier to trade uh, with each other. They also talked, uh, again, about on the global scale, about our shared commitment to the rapid conclusion of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is something that all three leaders indicated uh, support for and uh, concluding them as quickly as possible, but also uh, ensuring that these are uh, high standard agreements that, that carry us to the next level and that help North America level the playing field and trade more efficiently with one of the fastest growing economic areas in the world, and it's the Trans-Pacific um, uh, region. We also talked about regional and global cooperation. Uh, there was an emphasis in the discussions on the work that we can do together in Central America to increase competitiveness in Central America, to uh, raise levels of development, and to help address security issues. And sp there were some specific areas that we're happy to talk about uh, a little later on that. We also talked uh, among ourselves about citizen security uh, and the recognition of the fact that prosperity and security go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Uh, and uh, in, our, in our discussions with uh, Mexico and Canada, we have very strong bilateral relationships with each of them on security issues. What we talked about was what we can do together to uh, focus on what we can do as a region, as a North American region, uh, on issues related to uh, uh, confronting global threats such as international terrorism, cyber crime, uh, those sorts of things that have a serious impact potentially on our uh, security as, as a group. As we are more interconnected, we, are, uh, we have greater vulnerability to events in each other's countries, so we have a shared interest in ensuring each other's uh, security. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of the, of the key areas that, uh, where there was some movement. Uh, first, uh, creating a North American Trusted Traveler Program. This is something that we, ha uh, these Trusted Traveler Programs are something that we already have well underway with each country. Now we're looking at how we can do this on a trilateral basis. Uh, harmonizing trade data uh, consistent with, our, uh, with international standards to make it easier for companies to import and export from the region. Uh, Mexico, Canada, and the United States each have different sets of, of requirements for traders, uh, and they will continue to do so uh, according to their own uh, national guidelines. But there is a much greater opportunity for interoperability among these. The president, right before he arrived uh, in Mexico, signed an executive order that uh, is going to streamline uh, the uh, process for importers and exporters from the United States. Instead of having to send paperwork to some 42 agencies across uh, the U.S. government, this is going to create a single window uh, for uh, goods to be processed. And that's very important 
for Canada and Mexico and for our relationship with Canada and Mexico given the, the predominance uh, of those two countries in our, in our uh, trade. Uh, we're also looking at creating a North American transportation plan to bring greater order to our uh, regional infrastructure uh, and also to strengthening our trilateral regulatory cooperation. Again, since we build things together, having similar standards uh, and requirements makes more sense in, in some areas. We're also going to be uh, looking at other areas. In terms of innovation and education, uh, one key to our competitiveness is the skill of our workforce, and that makes us highly productive on, on the global, uh, in the global economy. So we're going to be increasing student uh, exchanges, and that's part of that, uh, but also finding what we can do to build skills in the existing workforce. On energy and climate change, uh, the leaders announced that we'll hold a North American Energy Ministerial later in 2014. Uh, again, this is an area for uh, priority work on, by all three governments. Uh, on citizen security, among, uh, aside from the issues that I already mentioned, there's also going to be uh, increased uh, collaboration to combat trafficking in persons, uh, a matter that affects all three mm -hmm. countries. Uh, and, and finally, just as a specific uh, example of what we're going to be doing, in Central America we're going to be working together to uh, support a disaster risk insurance pool. And what this uh, does is it creates uh, the ability for uh, regional governments to pool their resources and purchase uh, insurance to meet immediate needs uh, following a natural disaster. And this is something that exists already in the Caribbean. There's interest in working with Central American governments to uh, support their own uh, ongoing efforts to create such a pool. So with that, uh, those are the highlights and I'll be happy to answer any questions with uh, specifics about the events. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, I think Ricardo has very successfully captured the substance of the conversations that the three leaders had. I think um, having spent more time um, on the North American relationship uh, than Ricardo, since I've been doing it, it feels like forever, but, but it's not. But, but either with Mexico bilaterally or on the trilateral relationship for close to 10 years now, um, and been part of, in some way, all of the previous North American leader summits, I think there was a level of enthusiasm um, and a level of um, achievement at this summit that had not been present recently. And I think this is a little bit what the leaders meant when they talked about a North American moment, about the North American vision. Um, it obviously does come 20 years after NAFTA when the world has changed pretty dramatically and these three leaders want to make sure that North America remains highly competitive and out in front of the rest of the world, not responding uh, to it. Um, these are young leaders, uh, two of them veterans obviously, one of them a bit newer. Um, but there is, I think, a, a vision that the three of them have in part because of their uh, of their age and their perspective on the world that I think is, is quite complementary. Um, the other couple things I would say is I thought it was interesting and important that so many of the themes that you saw the President highlight in the State of the Union were very much present in this summit and it reinforces the sort of um, what we like to call at the State Department, the intermestic nature of the North American relationships. They are both foreign policy and in some ways very much directly connected to our domestic policy and our domestic well-being. Um, so I think that was, that was very important. And I also thought, Ricardo talked about the focus on energy and climate change. That was a big part of the discussion. Um, and obviously as North America increases its energy production um, and really becomes a, a powerhouse on the energy side, that is what makes possible greater discussion about what may be um, done in conjunction uh, for Central America and the Caribbean where this issue is so critical um, in part because of climate change issues. So there's a very real connection there. And then finally I would mention, uh, Ricardo alluded to it, when these three leaders get together they always talk about the rest of the world. Um, we have uh, a way of looking at the world that is similar based on values and democratic principles and open economic systems that enables us to have a conversation about things that concern us in the region and in the world that is always very productive. I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, we'll open the floor up for questions then. Um, all right. Um,
Good morning. I'm Julio Marenko with NTN24. Since uh, I'm going to take on your last sentence that the leaders talk about the rest of the world and the region Oops. specifically, uh, and uh, I want to know if uh, there's any new uh, developments regarding Venezuela. Uh, the State Department acknowledged the uh, expulsion of the three uh, diplomats, and uh, we're still waiting on the on a response uh, from the State Department. We want to know if uh, you have already like a response. And to Ricardo, I want to know from the perspective of the uh, uh, National Security Council, how do you see the situation in Venezuela? Do you see that this can be like a like a threat for uh, instability in the region, or do you see that it's going to be mainly focused in in Venezuela? Thank you. Well, let me start off by saying um, that I think you all saw the President's comments in Toluca addressing Venezuela, um, and, and part of the reason for that was our concern with things that were happening in Venezuela and the importance of making sure as we move forward that, that there is space for conversation, space for political opposition, space for peaceful protest, and I want to underscore that. Uh, we've been very clear uh, that we reject and condemn violence from any quarter, but there must be space for peaceful protest and for conversations about differences of opinion on where Venezuela is going. Um, we also have made very clear, uh, and the President called it a distraction, <coughs> but I think he's right. We have made very clear that Venezuela's future has been and will be for Venezuelans to decide, not for the United States. And, and we are being used in this in a way that is not productive. Um, on the, the expulsion of our three diplomats, um, they are all back in the United States now. Uh, I will be meeting with them today. Um, we are still in the process of our decision as to how we will respond, and that will be made public when we come to the conclusion of it. Um, but, you know, as you know, there are a, a range of things a government can do, and we'll make that decision and announce those when we have decided. Okay. So, just uh, adding on to uh, Roberta's comments, another element that has really concerned us has been the emphasis on uh, suppressing freedom of expression and access by the media to cover events that are ongoing. And one of the most important things is that the population of Venezuela and international community have a very clear understanding of what's, of what's happening. And uh, so the, we would, in particular, uh, call on respect uh, for the media and respect for freedom of expression, as Roberta mentioned. Uh, with respect to how we view the situation in Venezuela in regional terms, uh, number one, Venezuela is a very important country in, uh, in South America. It uh, has a population that is uh, sophisticated and involved across the spectrum of inter-American activities. So we do have uh, a very clear understanding of, of Venezuela's importance, but it really is most important in terms of respect for hemispheric norms. We're all bound by the Inter-American Democratic Charter, including Venezuela. Uh, there has to be a clear demonstration of respect for uh, the norms that are displayed there. You cannot simply separate a, a, a very large portion of your population and declare them to be somehow in opposition to democracy because they do not concur with your, with your political views. So uh, for us, what's in most important is that the region continue to express its support for respect for democracy, human rights, and fundamental freedoms in Venezuela. We're going to continue to, to address those as well. And just to follow on to what Roberta said, this is not about the United States. For us, this has always been about process and not personalities, uh, and we are going to continue to, to focus on uh, respect for fundamental freedoms and human rights in Venezuela, where uh, we have grave concerns at the moment. Uh, thank you, Sonia Schotter, today with OCN Colombia and Diario de las Americas. Uh, my question is for both. Since the United States is championing uh, democracy around the world, I would like to know, do you still consider Venezuela a democracy? And what is the fine line who divides a country? Uh, it's a democracy or not, it's a, or it's not a democracy. Thank you. As important as I think it is that countries abide by the norms of democracy, I, I think that you're always looking at a spectrum, not, not a moment in time when something becomes 
undemocratic or democratic, clearly the Venezuelan people want to be able to express their opinions peacefully, and that is a fundamental part of democracy, as is in the Inter-American Democratic Charter a free press. Um, it is called a fundamental component. So it is not a question of declaring at a particular moment in time whether something is or is not a democracy. Ricardo's absolutely right. All of us in the Americas who took that commitment to both the OAS Charter and then the Inter-American <coughs> Democratic Charter, which made more specific and fulsome our responsibilities, are at this point responsible for upholding those tenets. Um, and, and that is very, very important in this moment. We are seeing elements of that that are not being respected, and that's why we speak out and urge the government to allow people to protest peacefully and express their opinion. A and just as important is to ensure that those citizens or groups have more than just peaceful protest as a way of channeling their concerns, right? The, the way one goes to peaceful protest if the institutions of government are not otherwise available for channeling those requests. And we have seen over uh, the last number of years a weakening of democratic institutions in Venezuela as well. And that is what concerns us, is that citizens need to be able to go, whether it's to ministries of government and have their voices heard, whether it's the judiciary, the legislature, the separate and equal and independent parts of government, as well as to hear from and, ex and explain through a free and independent media. All of those are part of what makes up democracy, not just elections. And all of those have to be available to the citizens of Venezuela to pursue their uh, agenda and their goals. Uh, that's just one thing on that. Precisely, that's precisely correct. It is more about the mechanics. It's more than just about the mechanics of democracy. It's about fostering a democratic culture. And everything that Roberta mentioned is what goes into fostering such a culture, and that's been our concern. The erosion of that support for civil society institutions and the ability of the population to ex fully express itself and participate in the democratic process is, is the most pressing concern for us. Yes. Canadian colleague had raised his hand a long time ago. Go ahead. Excellent. I'm Paul Coring with the Globe and Mail. I have a question, uh, I guess, for Roberta, given your um, long history on the file and given your my relative. age. You can say it, Paul. <laughs> given no, my no, age. I'm, I'm, I'm it's okay, much. I opened that door. <laughs> I was going to start out by asking about Trudeau and Reagan, and that would have just <laughs> dated me so badly, Thank right? You. In any event, um, you gave a fairly upbeat assessment of the kind of interaction mm -hmm. between these three leaders. But I've been reading communiques long enough to know that when you get a whole series of planning and creating and intending and hoping and all those ings in a communique, sometimes means that not much got done, but that there was a lot of hopeful, forward-looking, happy talk. Can you kind of square that circle? What got done? I, I, I can try. Um, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, I think gerunds are good. Um, I, th <laughs> I think I'm pro gerund. Uh, I, I think in part what that reflects is a feeling of renewal or reactivated uh, or, or energy among the presidents. I, I don't think any of them would deny that we haven't been moving as fast as we would like over the last few years, whether it's because of recession in individual countries and globally, whether it's because of um, efforts elsewhere that needed to be brought to fruition. Obviously, uh, the Obama administration was very focused in its first term on the pending uh, trade deals that, that we had and moving those forward. And so I think when you look at things that are being launched, decided, or things that are being accelerated, it, it is not unfair to say that there was a sense from the presidents that more probably should have been done, right? Uh, especially while you know we were focused extensively on our domestic job creation, um, 
but there was a recognition that the domestic job creation, the competitiveness at home, the development <coughs> of the next workforce depends on working with these two countries uh, to get it done. So it, it isn't unfair to say that some of these things are prospective. Um, but it also, I, I have to say, as a, as a bureaucrat sitting at the table with the leaders, um, it was also a pretty swift kick in the pants for bureaucracies um, to get these things done. Uh, the leaders feel very strongly that a lot of the things that we are doing will bear fruit, whether it's the Trusted Traveler program, which is really fairly novel, this notion that we will um, integrate our Trusted Traveler programs. And it's always been enormously important that we increase our Trusted Traveler programs so that we can all focus on those goods, people, whatever that may be in fact threats or, or risks. So these are incredibly important um, initiatives and the President and, and the Prime Minister made very clear that they expect movement on this, that they not be, be get bogged down and that in some places where they felt it has gotten bogged down um, they want to see that movement sooner than the next summit, right? So. So I do think there's a, a legitimate um, analysis that says this is more forward-looking than we have achieved the following, but I think there is also a great sense of um, possibility for the coming year. So let me just add to that since I was uh, involved in helping craft some of those gerunds. Uh, uh, <laughs> Look, I, I, no. Uh, look, let me say this. First of all, the push really did come from the leaderships in all three countries. I can tell you yeah. that uh, there was extensive discussion uh, on, in the White House, and the level of ambition among the leadership is quite high. Uh, what we're talking about, the real challenge is that we're now talking about the hardest elements of uh, driving integration among our countries. We have three different regulatory systems. We have trading systems that have converged quite a bit that are still rather far apart. And we tried to address as much of this as we could, but also to try to set a high bar for ourselves. Because the fact is, the way that North America becomes more competitive is by reducing the barriers between the three countries so that we can export to the world. In the case of Mexico, 37 cents of every dollar they export are uh, contain U.S. products. US uh, in the case of Canada, it's at least 25 cents on every dollar. Canada exports, and U.S. exports also contain a very large component of both Mexican and Canadian exports, so import, excuse me, input. So what you see is a very clear understanding of where it is that we're, our prosperity is going to come from in, in the coming decades, and trying to deal with the mechanics of bringing our systems together wherever we can. That is very challenging work, but it's also work where we have a clear direction from all three leaders to get it done. Let me, let me also just add that one of the things you also see, I think, in this communique is um, and I, I have to say, this is, you know, this makes me sad and happy at the same time because I feel like Bob Pastor is looking down on us. Uh, the, the acolyte, really, uh, uh, all of us are, are acolytes of Bob in, in looking at uh, mm -hmm. North America. But, but a lot of what we're ra really trying to do now is take parallel bilateral processes and make them truly trilateral. And, and as Ricardo says, that is very hard, but that is actually where we have to go. Mm -hmm. And we were honestly kind of content to look at progress that was bilateral for quite a while. And I think what our leaders said to us is, I don't understand why we can't be doing this, all three of us together now. My name's Alex uh, Panetta with the Canadian Press, and I won't be quizzing you on your grammar. Um, just uh, so the, the president said something that was uh, that some people found intriguing about uh, greenhouse gas emissions during the uh, final press conference. Uh, he suggested that he and Stephen had had a chat after lunch about uh, about working together to reduce GHGs. Um, uh, without asking you to roll out the details of any of any possible plan, I'd just like to get some uh, clarity um, about what general. Uh, type of uh, initiative he might have been referring to. So could you please just walk us through some of the possibilities that he might have been referring to? Well, I'm going to start off by saying we, we, we can't actually, we couldn't reveal to you if we wanted to what they actually said since we weren't in that conversation <laughs> that was between the two leaders. And I'll leave it to Ricardo to see how we'd like to characterize the subject matter, though. Well, look, we do see uh, the, the president and the 
all three leaders recognize the importance of energy in, in North America. The, the fact is that we have a comparative advantage uh, as a region, and that is making us more productive for the moment. Uh, but the president also signaled that because of that uh, advantage, we also have a com we also have a particular responsibility in the international community to to set the targets as high as we can and as ambitiously as we can. We have this moment, uh, and so the idea is to use. You know, we have tremendous levels of cooperation uh, on environmental issues, not just through the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, but we also work together under the on, under the Montreal Protocol. Uh, on phasing down HFC production and consumption, uh, on continuing coordination in the climate and clean air coalition, and something else that we kind of left off in, in a lot of our discussion, which is the, that ECPA, the uh, Energy and Climate Partnership of the Americas that we hosted by Mexico, is another opportunity to take this advantage that we have and focus to the future on how we can take this moment to, to uh, work together to uh, to set a, a clear path for the international community. That is a special responsibility that we see. I think there's an understanding that uh, the multilateral system as it exists right now uh, is important, but we should. We, there's a lot more that we can do. And uh, in fact, a lot of that leadership is being shown in North America right now. And seeing what we can do to kind of amp that up uh, is, is a big part of the discussion. Roberta's right. Since we weren't in those personal discussions, I, I am in no position to share the details, which is a very lucky position for us. Le leaders always retain the right to talk to each other without us present. We keep trying. I know, right? <laughs> Thank you. Ruben Barrera with the Mexican News Agency, North Mex. I had two questions, uh, one for Ricardo and one for, not the only one for both. Uh, uh, Ricardo, um, the same day that the uh, transnational meeting and uh, a couple of hours later, the, um, uh, the foreign minister of Mexico, Mr. Meade, uh, he said publicly that President Obama promised President Peña Nieto that the U.S. won't be spying anymore on him. So the question is, I wonder if he made that the same offer to Minister Harper and if he had been doing the same offer to another Latin American leader, especially President Rousseff from Brazil. And my second question is, uh, goes to uh, the relationship between Mexico and the U.S. The border is not the same place when you were stationed at Brunsville, Ricardo. And, and that's, that's something that uh, uh, caught my attention because what had been here before the meeting and what had been here for a long time is about this uh, uh, good momentum, uh, good momentum in, in the relationship between both countries. But the border seems to reflect a different reality so I wonder, how can you square that, especially when we, I mean, we just two days ago, mm -hmm. we have another case of a Mexican undocumented mm -hmm. or a Mexican citizen mm -hmm. shot and killed by uh, a Border Patrol agent. According with Mexico, since 2010, uh, 20, 21 Mexicans have been killed uh, by Border Patrol agent. And, and we seems like, uh, you know, the border is reflecting a constant tension between both countries that, again, goes against all the things, nice things that, that we hear coming out from either the Congress or the White House. So let me take the first part, and then uh, uh, Roberta uh, will uh, weigh in on, on, on the questions. But on the first one, I, I should tell you that the, the President laid out in his January 17th speech uh, the principles uh, that he has established and the plans and the actions that he's instructed uh, his interagency to proceed with, with respect to uh, uh, the the issue of the disclosures of the student disclosure. So he's on the record. It's very clear. He laid out a, a path for uh, our uh, actions on this. We've continued throughout this to consult uh, with uh, governments and uh, with friends and allies. And Mexico is one of those friends and allies that we've maintained a very good level of discussion with. Uh, and uh, we, you know, as these issues arise, we continue to talk uh, through those. On the second question you asked, I'm going to uh, let Roberta respond, but I will say, uh, having been in the Matamoros uh, side of the border uh, 20 years ago, uh, at that point there was also a, uh, there were you know, daily uh, issues that maybe didn't have the same level of profile, they were considered more local issues. But a lot of those matters we're continuing to deal with today with a much higher level of uh, transit, especially in terms of trade. Uh, and you're right, the world has changed. Uh, but uh, the fact is, this is something we continue to, to work through, just like any two countries on, uh, on a border of that size and with that level of activity between them. 
Roberta. Yeah, I mean, let me start out by saying that obviously um, the incident that occurred a couple of days ago, any incident uh, of use of force by, by Border Patrol or violence um, uh, coming from uh, those who may be crossing or responding by Border Patrol is something that both they and we regret greatly. It, it is not obviously uh, what we like to see. Um, but I think that you have to look at the entire border over the last year or two and the way in which we've been working together with the Mexican government. And then you come up, I think, with a situation in which the reality I is much closer to the political statements. That is to say, in the last year or two, since the Peña Nieto government came to office, um, it has been very important for that government to have a conversation with us about border violence and about the response to border violence, something we agree with. We held a number of very important meetings on, including as part of our bilateral human rights dialogue, on border violence and how we were going to respond. We've had reciprocal visits by each country to talk about what our border forces confront every day, what their rules of engagement may be, how they're trained, what techniques they can use, and how they can communicate more fluidly across the border uh, because the threats may be ones that are equally problematic on both sides of the border. And so there is no <laughs> doubt that there is still violence along the border. Uh, there are still criminal actors who may be moving people, who may be moving drugs, who may be moving bulk cash. Um, both of us want to be able to reduce that in ways that are humane and legal. Um, but the, I would argue that all of the positive things that you hear from leaders about the way in which we're working together, in fact, includes the border even though you have circumstances that are very regrettable of violence and in this case death of somebody who was crossing and even though Mexico may protest those actions. This is how responsible countries continue to deal with a problem which both have acknowledged. This is a problem, how the border is managed um, and reducing levels of violence and we have seen significant reductions in violence in some areas. This was the first incident that resulted in death in over a year, yeah. I believe. Um, now, obviously, we'd like that to be even longer, um, but we're going to continue working on this with Mexico, which has proven to be uh, a good partner on these issues. Hi, good morning. Uh, Luis Alonso with the AP. I would like to do a follow-up on what was discussed previously on Venezuela. If I may, um, Director Zuniga, um, I see that in, today, this morning, the, in social, several social networks, uh, people from the opposition in Venezuela have been organizing, trying to place thousands of calls uh, to the White House phone number asking for help. SOS Venezuela is the message. So my question is, we have seen that the U.S. has been calling for the, the respect of freedom of expression and, and peaceful assembly, but uh, so far these callings have had no visible, uh, have not made a difference on the ground there. What uh, could the White House, what could offer, uh, what, could, what kind of help could the White House uh, do to this request from the activists? Uh, and, and and my other question for, for uh, Assistant Secretary, um, I, want, I would like to know whether um, among the, the measures taken to re respond to the expulsion the, of the three diplomats uh, from, from Venezuela, is one of those options uh, to uh, ad bring the, ask the, the activation of the uh, charter uh, at the OAS, or, or no, that's out of the question. That's not one of the options being, uh, thank you. So on the, on the first question, uh, it's not just calls from the United States. I think this is the most important element I want to uh, emphasize here. It's not, this is not a, an issue between the United States and Venezuela. This is an issue between the Venezuelan government and its people. And 
it is also a matter of concern to the inter-American community as a whole, but not just to the inter-American community. The EU uh, uh, has also called for a cessation of violence and uh, respect for freedom of expression and assembly. Uh, the OAS uh, has signaled that as well. The OAS Secretary General has signaled that as well. Many governments across the region have expressed their concern. So uh, we uh, want to make clear that we do support uh, the ability of the uh, Venezuelan people to fully exercise their freedoms and to <coughs> be able to express themselves without fear of violence or repression. That is very important. As part of that, I want to make clear that this is not a, uh, this is not primarily about the United States. We are a member of the international community and a community that is calling for uh, improved conditions, respect for freedoms and human rights in Venezuela. Let me say that on the, on the response to the, the PNGs, to the expulsions of Americans, I think it's really important that, that we act in response within the Vienna Convention, within the rights and responsibilities that we have um, in our diplomatic relationship with Venezuela. The Inter-American Democratic Charter is a, is a, a regional document, uh, an expression of commitment <coughs> via the OAS, uh, to which Venezuela and all of the other countries of the OAS are adherents. Um, that's not something that we would invoke as part of a response to a bilateral action, uh, in part because of what Ricardo said, because the two things are entirely separate. Even though the Venezuelan government in expelling our people uh, on baseless charges may be trying to conflate the two things, um, they are not the same. Our relationship with Venezuela is not Venezuelan government's relationship with its people. The other thing I want to say is w we have already been talking about the instruments of the inter-American system and the situation in Venezuela. If you look at uh, what was discussed the other day at the OAS in the Permanent Council, um, we, made a, we made a statement. Um, many others made statements. Uh, the Venezuelan representative spoke for a very long time. Um, and, and we, with our colleagues from other countries around the hemisphere, have already discussed the issue of upholding um, the principles of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, including the right to peaceful assembly and protest, the right to freedom of expression. So. One can formally invoke the Inter-American Democratic Charter, and we'll see whether that proves the right tool for this. But its principles, and even the forum, that is the OAS, have already begun to be discussed. Hi, Megan Fitzpatrick from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and it's time for a Keystone XL pipeline question for you. Oh, damn, um, <laughs> it's about you time, guys right? Be, you guys were going to be out of character, and I was uh, loving it. Uh, no, no. <laughs> um, how much time did the two leaders spend talking about it, and was it the same old conversation with Prime Minister Harper pressing Obama for an answer? and that answer to be approving it, and Obama saying that the process is being followed, or um, was it not the typical conversation? Was there any nugget of news in there that you can give us in terms of what they, uh, what they discussed? And um, secondary question, the decision from the Nebraska court, what impact might that have on the State Department's process? Are you sticking to the 90-day timeline? Will that be adjusted? Uh, just generally, what, what does that decision mean to the State Department process? Thank you. I'll, I'll take the first part of that. Uh, and before the uh, summit, it was very clear. What the president says privately is what he says publicly. This is, there's a process in place. The process will be followed. Uh, there is uh, no news for us to make until that process has been completed. Uh, and uh, that's also what was uh, contained in, in the conversation. At this point, this really is about process. And it's, uh, it's an established set process. We've been very clear. And the President has also been very clear about what considerations are important to him as he, as he reviews this once it reaches him. Um, on the Nebraska decision, all I can say is it's still a little bit early. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and I know that lots of lawyers are looking at what the implications of it may be on our process. Um, Nebraska has its own process that it has to go through. 
Um, so I think it's, there, I don't have an answer to you as to how this will affect the timing uh, or whether it will affect the timing, and I do think that's, that's the open question. Can I just ask in a, in a different way? Um, like, Harper raises this every time with Obama when they meet. We've had several Canadian ministers coming to Washington lobbying on Capitol Hill. Um, there, our government is spending millions of dollars on an advertising campaign. Is all of that really a waste of time and money then if it's just a process being followed? I, I, I would never criticize the Canadian government's sovereign decision on how it uses either its time or its resources. Seriously, I, I, I just don't think that's something that I'm going to comment on. Their decision. <laughs> uh oh. Um, hi, I'm Lucia Leal for, with Avenue Services. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's a question on Venezuela for both of you. Um, I wanted to know if you're concerned uh, about the situation of the opposition leader, Leopoldo Lopez, who is held in military jail. And also related to that, uh, President Maduro has said uh, that the Venezuelan ambassador to the OAS uh, got a phone call from a State Department official threatening with uh, retaliation in case Leopoldo Lopez was captured. Uh, you've denied um, all involvement in this, but I wanted to know if you also deny that specific allegation. Thank you. Uh, let me start with Leopoldo Lopez because I need to make sure that everyone understands that I'm repeating what we've said. So we have already spoken about this, which is to say, yes, we are concerned. We're concerned about about the his situation and about um, you know the the legal process <coughs> moving forward. Um, what's very important and very clear is that um, having been detained uh, after being part of a peaceful proce protest that that he outlined was important to remain peaceful, it was clear that there was violence at those protests, and I am not assigning blame. I do not know who may have instigated violence, but I will say that we are very concerned um, that this not have a chilling effect on the opposition, which it seems to me it may have been designed to do. Um, most important is that any charges brought against him be thoroughly adjudicated in an impartial and transparent way. Um, and there is great concern about that, given past practice recently in Venezuela. Um, so I think that we do have concerns about that case in particular. On the issue of what uh, Ambassador Chatterton said at the OAS the other day, let me, let me also be clear, we never denied we had a phone conversation with the Venezuelan government. One of the things that Secretary Kerry was quite clear about in his conversation with Foreign Minister Hawa last June in Guatemala um, when we sought to put our relationship on a more positive and pragmatic footing was that it was important that when we had differences, we discuss those differences in diplomatic channels and not through the media alone, which is the reason that we made a phone call to the only Venezuelan government representative of a senior rank in the United States at the time. Um, to have a conversation about things that concerned us. Among the things that concerned us as a possible um, a trigger to more tension was arrest of opposition leaders. It was not a threat. It was not a demand. It was a concern that any actions that increase tensions between the government and the opposition and did not involve dialogue in the reduction of tensions and violence could be very, very damaging. Not anything more than that. And unfortunately, the government of Venezuela did not, decided not to respond to that phone conversation in diplomatic channels, but to do so uh, with, a public, uh, al with public allegations that, that are not true. So we regret that because we had hoped to have as we had sought a diplomatic conversation on things that concern us. So the only thing I would add to that is uh, something else that we've also said, uh, which is that not only Leopoldo Lopez, but we call for the release of all those who've been detained in connection with these activities, or at least to, that they be 
uh, assured and fair process. And as Roberta mentioned, we have some concerns based on, uh, on recent history uh, about the, the fairness uh, of the process applied to those accused of uh, crimes in Venezuela.